It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier. I think our track record in the last 20 years, how many NFC's titles, playoff appearances, and appearances in the NFC Championship game, those are some of the metrics I look at, and um, I'll compare our record with uh, almost anybody. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios. This is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Dropped this morning, 6 a.m. Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan are the hosts. Jeff Mosher's here on a Mosher Monday. And, of course, Inside the Birds brings you Football at Four. This hour is brought to you by Prop Swap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bets and take your profit. Find out how at PropSwap.com. Download the Prop Swap app today. Jeff Mosher is in the house, and we've got a lot to kind of dive into as we are now less than two weeks from the NFL draft motion. Another day, uh, everybody seems to be just conjuring up things as we get closer to the draft, which we expect. But I got a lot of things that I want to kind of dive into. Plus, we have our listeners and viewers sending questions in for you that we will pop up on the screen and let you answer as well. So how are you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm uh, looking forward to the draft, and uh, obviously I feel like um, the draft could go in a variety of ways. But as we sit here on this Monday, Mosh, do they pick at 12, or do you feel, are you starting to feel they're going to find a way to get in, uh, get out of that spot? I think there's a pretty good chance, Mike, that they'll trade up depending on, on uh, well, I mean, the opportunity is there to trade up. It all depends on how the draft falls. And and you would have to tell me what the Falcons do at four and what the Lions do at seven. And I feel like that's where the guesswork is. If we assume that five and six with Cincinnati and Miami is some kind of combo of pits and chase, yep. which means that Atlanta passed on one of them and maybe traded out for a quarterback, um, then, I, I, then I don't know. If, if more than three quarterbacks go in the top ten, and that pushes the non-quarterback positions down. You get a couple offensive linemen go. I think Detroit becomes a big wild card, but they take – they need anything. They need offensive linemen. They need a wide receiver. They can take a, a lot of different positions. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that if the Eagles want a cornerback, they're going to watch how this draft go unfolds one through five, six, seven, and then perhaps make a move if they feel – like they have to get over Dallas and New York to get the corner that they want. Yeah, it's funny. We had Sal on Friday show, and he had kind of said he thinks the, six, the the Eagles are targeting that nine spot, the one spot ahead, because Patrick Sertan would be the guy. If they really want a corner, that they and if they want the one that they want, that they're going to have to move out of 12 to go get that. Do you agree that if they want a corner and they want the one that they want, they're not going to get that guy at 12? May even have to be eight, Mike, because Denver is pretty stocked at wide receiver. They've got some good offensive linemen. I don't think that if they're not going to go quarterback there, you can see Den- Denver's nine, if I'm correct, right? Said Denver nine, yeah. Uh, and Carolina's eight. Yeah, so I could see the Eagles feeling like they need to leave uh, Denver uh, for a cornerback, thinking that that's an area that the Broncos would look toward. They have a defensive-minded head coach in Vic, Vic Fangio. They've got some pretty good pass rushers there with Chubb and Miller. Um I don't know the, the type of team that's going to take that kind of a linebacker and Micah Parson there. So I think Denver is a team that would probably be in the market for corner, and you may have to go up ahead of them. Yeah, and I know if you just stay at 12, uh, there was a scenario that a listener brought up on Friday, and I want to get your take on this. Did I? Maybe this was – no, you were on Wednesday show, so this was after you. Um, the four quarterbacks are gone. The top mm-hmm. three receivers are gone. Mm-hmm. Pitts, Sewell. And Horn and Sertain, there's your 11 guys, are off the board. You're at 12. What do you do? Oh, boy. That's a good one. I mean, then I I suppose Rashawn Slater is there or Quiddy Pay is there. I would probably guess that the Eagles would take Quiddy Pay unless they got some tremendous offer from another team to move up. That's where I would – guess that they would go right strong strongly strongly kind of educated guess now if that was the case this is where i could see the people who did not like the trade really coming out and saying they moved down and they ended up with a player a second you know level player 
Okay, then you have to hate the first rounder that they you got along with it. I mean, that's if you if you hate the trade, then you can't be all excited about the potential of three first rounders next year, and and that's fine if you're not. You know, if you think that those first rounders are not going to be high picks, uh, because you think Miami will be good and you think um, Indianapolis will be good, then then you have every right to feel that way. Unfortunately, all we have is opinions right now until the pick is made, and yeah. then. The, the players perform. But I understand both sides of the uh, the argument. Right. No, I, and I think a lot of people, like, first off, drafting an offensive lineman is never the most, uh, you know, exciting thing. I personally don't think. And, by the way, uh, we had Jaws on Sunday. He was on the locker room Sunday. He basically – he said this. Take a listen. Uh, when it comes to uh, drafting of the offensive line and the defensive line, for that matter. And his defensive line is still one of the best in the NFL. The offensive line went healthy. Lane Johnson, Brandon Brooks come back, one of the best in the NFL. Uh, I don't think left tackle is a bigger problem than most people do. I look at the tape, and I thought, you know, the guys played well at the left tackle position. So he says, I don't think left tackle is the biggest problem that a lot of people do. I tend to agree with him to some extent is, look, I don't know that it's going to be a, a, a plus, but I'm willing to give those two guys a shot, more so my Alata than Dillard. But I'd let those two guys battle it out. But he kind of subscribes to, if your offensive line's healthy, that's not an area that you really need to target in this particular draft. No, I disagree. I think your offensive line can be healthy, but no matter what, you can't escape the fact that it's old and it's injury prone. Lane Johnson is not old, but he's getting, I think he is north of 30 or he will be in the season. He's obviously had his injuries. We know about Brandon Brooks being well over 30 and his injuries. We know Jason Kelsey uh, is 33 years old, has not been injured lately, but probably is not going to be playing uh, much longer past this year. And so that leaves you with Isaac Sayamalu, a good young player uh, at left guard. And then left tackle, you, you either Jordan Mailata or Andre Dillard. We'll see what happens there. But, I mean, you got three-fifths of your offensive line who's you can't guarantee will will be there at the end of the year. And we, you've already had two two seasons of seeing that happen. And I'll go even further and say the, the thing about Rashawn Slater from Northwestern, Mike, is that at 303 pounds, he's a guy that can play pretty much any position – on the offensive line. I've had two teams tell me that I de- he could play center in the NFL because he's that athletic and that skilled. And because he's a little bit short-armed, it might be better. It's just that you wouldn't want to draft a guy top 12, right, and then immediately start him at center, but maybe something later in his career. But you could move him to guard or tackle. And so I don't think it's a wasted pick because I personally believe that you're only as good as you are until a guy gets hurt. And that's why best player available to me is the approach. It's like saying – we're great at tight end because we have Dallas Goddard. We can trade Zach Ertz. What happens when Dallas Goddard gets hurt? Now you're down to Jason Kroom yeah. or, uh, you know, some of those other guys. So I would take the best player available. And for people who might be upset or – or and I hate when people do this, but I know they will. Quiddy Pay is not Brandon Graham. We're talking like how many years later? Over a decade later. P- teams really like Quiddy Pay. In fact, he could go higher than 12 because teams like him so much and there's not that many – um Four three type pass rushers that supply versus demand could work out in his favor. So I wouldn't look at the drafting as Quiddy Pay as some kind of like uh, a consolation prize after you move down. He could be he's expected to be a very good player. Yeah, it's just you know I think you brought this up the fact that in in most mock drafts you don't see an edge rusher in the top ten, which is rare. Uh, it is rare. I actually thought I was gonna. I did some research uh, and I thought I was gonna have to go back like three hundred years for that, but it did happen. Uh, for, I can't remember the draft. I think it was the 2010 draft. I'd have to go back and look, but there were no no pass rusher. It, the the highest one went 11th or 12th. So it's not as rare as I thought, but it's still fairly rare. Yeah, you know, going back to 2010, you're talking almost a decade that that happened. Yeah, yeah. And was that in the Brandon Grant? Was was Graham 2010? Uh, he was 2000. No, Macklin, I think was 2010. I think Graham was 2009. Okay, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it doesn't happen often when when teams and 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 Jaws in this same comment uh, said you have to give these were his quotes, not mine. You need mm-hmm. to give Roseman credit that he has taken the model of building the two lines and he has done a good job at finding talent on the on the offensive line and the defensive line. Uh, so if you think that they're going that he's going to hit on somebody, it would be in those two positions. You would think so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. That's one of the things that Adam and I talk about a lot on Inside the Birds. We have our fair share of criticisms, whether it's Doug Peterson, whether it's Howie, whether it's Jeff, 
Lurie, but we have credited Howie and the team identity that was really been in place since since Joe Banner and Andy Reid uh, were running things over a decade ago of building from the inside out. I think the Eagles do an excellent job, not only, at, uh, Mike, of, of doing that with first-round picks, right, but also in the later rounds. They do draft offensive and defensive linemen, and that's why you get guys like Josh Sweat, who has been a nice developmental story for them. I think the kid that they picked in the uh, last year, Driscoll, fourth round out of Auburn, is going to wind up being a starter for them. If not by the end of this year, then uh, certainly the start of the the next year. And he's a kid that Jeff Stoutland took to immediately liked. If you remember, he started the season opener at right tackle when Lane Johnson got hurt uh, ahead of Matt Pryor. So yeah. they really felt that Driscoll has uh, has has good potential. Uh, Sam Alu has worked out. Big V. Fifth round pick. Yeah. I mean, he, he got himself a nice contract. Yeah. So they've always done a pretty good job on on the trenches. I, I always credit them for that. Yep. Kelsey was a sixth round pick. My lot is a seventh round pick. So they have mm-hmm. found guys late. All right, let's get some of the listener questions. If you have one for Jeff, you can keep texting them in 609 403 0973. And if you're watching the show, we will uh, pop them up. This was from a text from Matt in EHT. He says, Jeff, how do you feel about the news coming out that the Eagles are looking to move back into the top 10? And who's their guy if they do that? Yeah, I mean, we just talked about that. I, I said I think that there's a, a good chance that they can do it, depending on how the bo- the board falls. And I would think that they're trying to get to eight or nine, probably eight. And if they do that, my sense is it would be for a cornerback. Uh, and then you get into the question of is it J.C. Horn or is it Patrick Sertain? Uh, I will. This is just my my feeling, not, not, not reporting anything officially, but I know how much that the team puts into analytics. And I feel like the analytics edge would go to a guy like J.C. Horn, who's just about as twitched up as you can get. So that's what I would say. That, yeah, that's my kind of early uh, guess on it. You know, that's an interesting question that you just kind of brought up, which kind of could peel into a whole nother category is, you know, I was talking earlier about which wide receiver, if there, if, if Smith and Waddle were both there at 12, which one complements better? Do they even care which one complements Rieger better? No, probably not. You just figure it out. I mean, to me, Waddle is is a, is a Z receiver, and that's also where Jalen Rager plays. Um, I, I guess I'd have to ask a little more on this. Can, can Devontae Smith play the X? You, you know, you see a lot of press coverage with the X. Now, the one thing is he's so fast that if you don't get your hands on him, you're dead. Uh, the, the other thing is he's very light, though. If you do get your hands on him, can he recover? So that is the kind of the, the big question between those two. But I think Waddle is going to go ahead of Devontae Smith just based on, you know, listen, nobody knew Ruggs was going to go ahead of uh, Judy last year, so anything can happen. But right. the, the feedback I get is that Waddle is the one that would go well, higher. And that's a good point is to keep in mind, Jefferson was, what, the fifth wideout taken. T. Yes. Higgins was, I think, the seventh wideout taken. Ayuk was in there, the Eight. sixth guy. Or Okay. So because yeah, Rager was, you're right. Uh, J- JJ was the fifth, I think. Uh, Rager, I know Rager was the fifth. JJ six. Ayuk seventh, and then and you're right. T Higgins there eighth. Right. So T Higgins ended up being probably the second most productive wide receiver. Claypool may have been the next guy, and he was also drafted <laughs> in the third round last year. So just getting the 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 first choice of them doesn't always mean you're getting the best one. Michael, yeah, and by the way, really quick on that, just because the, like the most productive receiver isn't always the best receiver either. It's it's you know who's on the team that's trailing a lot, who's on the team that's passing a lot, who's yeah. on the team that's got the better quarterback. I mean, there, a lot of stuff goes into that. Right before you came on, I was saying if Justin Jefferson played for the Jets, I don't think he's fourteen hundred yard Justin Jefferson. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right, and, and quite frankly, if he played for the Eagles, we're probably saying. Man, we pass on that guy, Rieger. He had 1,400 yards with the Vikings last year. Not that that yeah. would have happened. But or Higgins. They would have said uh, Higgins is the guy they should have taken. Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, Michael says, please tell me they won't pass on Waddle or Chase if available at 12. Well, I'll modify that. I don't think they'll pass. Well, first of all, I don't think Jamal, Jamar Chase is going to be there at 12. I don't think they would pass on Jamar Chase at 12 because I just simply don't think he's going to be there. Um, Waddle at 12. I don't know if he's going to be there either, but if he is, I think the Eagles would take him only if some of the guys we talk about, Sertain, Horn, Quiddy Pay, have already been taken. Um, yeah, Waddle and, and Smith, they're the two that seem like you do kind of see one of them getting. I've seen some going even deeper, like 16, 17, which is amazing to me, and, and mm-hmm. I don't know why that would be for those two, you know, but 
Uh, of the receivers, it seems that those are the two guys. Well, we know Chase isn't getting that far. Uh, David, now this is a long question, but he says, screw it, trade back to around 15 or 16 and, you know, just keep adding, adding, and get one of those second wide receivers, the Batemans, the Tonys, that kind of guy. I think you can't uh, rule that out. I think the Eagles are sitting in a prime spot at 12. The only thing is, who's trading up to 12 because they think that whoever is at 13 is going to take a quarterback at 14? I guess the Patriots are at 15, correct? 15 is New England, and there's some talk that the Bears might want to try to move. They're at 20. I cannot see. I know people know the Bears need a quarterback, but they, people have to understand, and I've been wrong before, but the, everybody who's involved with the Bears from a front office and a coaching staff standpoint is on a one-year deal right now. They have to win. They were lucky to be all retained this past year. They're not going to draft a, a quarterback that may need time to develop when they're all sitting there on their their fire me years. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they really need to win now. So I don't think the Bears are going to be anxious to be uh, getting a quarterback like Trey um, uh, Trey Lance yeah. who might need some development there. By the way, so a lot of people are sending questions in. I'm trying to put them up on the screen to show you that we're, we, we see them. They're kind of in reference to what we're talking about. Uh, Maka says we drafted three wide receivers last year. Let that class develop. You don't need to take another one. I don't know. Well, if I, agree. I mean, most most teams have four or five wide receivers, correct? Yeah. And what do they so, think yeah. of Hightower and Watkins? You know, I think they want to give them a chance. But I, I, I at the, by the same token, you know, I've heard people say this about linebackers. They took two last year, so don't take one this year. When you're a six round pick like Sean Bradley or uh, Quez Watkins, you are not guaranteed a spot on the team. I know Watkins had a nice flash play last year against what the Cardinals where he took a screen and, you know, and I know Hightower had some nice, uh, you know, separation. He would drop a couple of them after he separated, but the, you're just not guaranteed to make the team when you're a fifth, six and seven, you're almost fighting every year until you really prove you're, you're that good. So I never let that interfere with what I, how I'm drafting. I'm just going to take the, the best players I can. And if they beat out the guys I picked last year, all right, so be it. I still got the best players. Um, no, this is interesting. Let's get that D tackle. Uh, I, I have seen a very a little murmurs over the weekend about Bar- Barrymore from uh, Alabama, the defensive tackle. I guess he's the one defensive tackle on the board that could go in the first round. They have Fletcher Cox. They've got Hargrave, but that's a position they typically like. Would defensive tackle shock you? Shock me, no, because it's as you, for all the reasons you just said. Surprise me, yeah. I mean, I'd be a little surprised. That just me to me that means the draft fell in a really unpredictable way, right? And a lot of the guys we talk about went off the board and not as many quarterbacks were taken in the top 10 or 11, as you might think. By the way, that thing that said draft the DT Mike, is he, was he talking about you? Are, are you a defensive tackle? <laughs> no, I let's think Let's get was, that DT Mike. I, I thought that was, was you. I think it's let's get that DT comma Mike. Oh, man, I would so much rather it be DT Mike Gill. That would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's the position for me, man. (laughs) All right. Uh, Fair enough. Frank, if Justin Fields would slide, what chance do you think the Eagles would trade up and get him instead of a corner? (laughs) It's a good, very good question. I think, um, there's a lot of Eagles fans that would like that. Um, and then a lot of Eagles fans would hate that. That would be a very polarizing decision. By the way, what's up, Frank? It's been a while. Um, I, I just, I think once the Eagles traded out, Mike, of five, um, I think they recognized they were not in the market for a quarterback in the first round. That's just my personal feeling on it. Um, I think that presents a very interesting situation because maybe they didn't think Fields would be there. But to me, it's like if he's there, then somebody's probably trading up with the Eagles to get him and the Eagles are moving back instead of taking him there. Now, uh, this one, now he spelled your name wrong, but he did say Jeff with a J. He's Jeff with a G. But, Andrew, for Jeff, if one of the four quarterbacks happened to be there at 12, would the Eagles even consider taking them? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of like the Justin Fields question yep. there. I, I really I, – I, I just believe that when they moved out of, uh, of six there, they, they were moving out of the quarterback in the first-round conversation. Um, I'm not a big fan of taking the quarterback in the first round this particular year. I mean, you drafted a kid in the second round last year. Yeah, I got to I got to ask you about that because you went on vacation. I heard you make a comment about what, uh, you know something like why why take a question mark this year when you had a question mark last year, and I I just I guess I didn't understand what you were trying to say because theoretically, if you took a quarterback in the first round this year, you really believe 
that that's your, it's not like the, the the front office thinks oh this guy's a question mark but you know they they would really believe that he was the guy so I mean you wouldn't you would, if they took Trevor Lawrence you wouldn't be upset right um, let's be honest. if they took Trevor Lawrence would you be upset no no obviously there you go <laughs> but I don't think that any other player is is on that level. No, so we're going by the Mike Gill grading system here. Well, I'm just Trevor saying, Lawrence. <laughs> well, do, do you think anybody's comparable to Lawrence? Like, do you have somebody that close to him? Uh, I, you know, I don't. I kind of try to leave it to the information. I, I feel like the information I get on Zach Wilson and Fields and Trey Lance is that these guys all project. Now we all know that word is is amorphous, right? But they all project to be better than what Jalen Hurts projected to be coming out of college. And if I were a GM and I felt that way, my well, evaluation is any of those guys did better than I would take them. Didn't Cosell say on Inside the Draft that he yes. thought Hurts and Fields were comparable? No, he said one quarterback coach who he spoke to okay. felt that they were comparable. But both, all Adam, I, Greg, I'm sure, have also spoke to several people in the league. Uh, I know Daniel Jeremiah has been outspoken about it uh, or a lot of other people that – they feel like these guys. I'm not. I'm not going to put Mac Jones in that conversation. I'm, um, Fields, Lance, Wilson, Lawrence, of course, all project to be top of the line QBs more so than they projected Jalen Hurts coming out of college. Yeah, I, I like. I mean, to me, Hurts. I personally, and look, I'm not Greg Cosell. I'm not some draft expert. I'm just going off of the guys that I watch, and it's just saying to me, to me, mm-hmm. Hurts is comparable to these guys, like. Th- and if I say Fields is better, I said this. If Fields is better, it would be like saying that Russell Wilson's better than Deshaun Watson. I'm not saying they're on that level, but that's how, like, I don't know, is Wilson better than Watson? Maybe slightly? But- I mean, they had similar careers, to Justin Fields and Deshaun Watson. It was certainly not out of the out of the realm that he could be that good. Right, but I'm saying, like, to me, that's where Hurts and Fields are. Like, okay, one's Russell Wilson, the other one's Deshaun Jack, Deshaun Watson. Right, but, but why would, why do you think then that just to, that Jalen Hurts was not a top ten pick then? If you felt like that they, he had that kind of, oh, I mean, people ability get, look, or an acumen. There's a lot of guys that people got. Drew Brees was a second round pick. He turned out to be pretty darn good. No, I mean, no, no. Russell I Wilson understand was a the third round pick. The rule. Yeah. I'm just wondering why you feel that Jalen Hurts is as good as a guy who might go in the top five or ten this year. Like well, what? I think a lot of times the quarterbacks get pushed up just because there's such a a, a desire to get one. Yeah, so sure. sometimes I feel that they're overdrafted. Like if you well, were, to, I mean, yeah, that's fair. But that also to, probably applies to Jalen Hurts, who sure. was not considered a second rounder. But go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. So, like, if you say that we're going to just rank the guys based on player, not that I need a quarterback in the worst of ways. Mm-hmm. Many of these guys, I don't think – like, I think you would take other players ahead of them. It's just that you teams just need these quarterbacks so Certainly. bad Certainly. that that's what ends up happening. I like Hurts. I, I think that Hurts has good arm strength. I, I was surprised at his inaccur- his uh, completion percentage last year. He did not display accuracy issues when he was in college. I don't know right. if that has to do with the Eagles' weapons or lack thereof, the simplicity of the offense. That's another thing that – we don't have a lot of time, but – the Eagles' offense, I feel, had to be simplified because of the problems on the offensive line. Moving guys from left guard to left right guard, from right guard to right tackle, from right – Yeah. So that they had fair. to dumb down the offense so much because I got Herbig playing left guard one week, right guard the next week, prior playing left guard one week, like right tackle the next week. They had to simplify the offense for those guys, not necessarily for the skill players. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation. I agree Because I feel like they did that – up for that, like not as much motion as you thought, not as much pre snap movement, but so many vertical routes when you could have just had shorter intermediary routes to accommodate for your bad offensive line, and yet not that. So um, I understand what you're saying, and I and I also don't look at Jalen Hurts' stats from last year at all to try to rate him. I thought he was impressive. I don't want people to think I'm anti Jalen Hurts yeah. at all. I thought he was very impressive for what he was able to do, despite what the stats say. I just as a, as a pure, like traditional kind of field scout mentality if i have a player who grades to be a pro bowl quarterback all pro whatever i'm gonna take him and it doesn't matter to me if i drafted a kid in the second round maybe that's what the eagles thought last year when they drafted him in the second round <laughs> <laughs> then they probably should have taken him higher <laughs> all right uh, that's football at four today that's uh we got uh, a lot more leading into the draft andrew will take more of your draft questions tomorrow 
Moshe will be back on Wednesday. Listen to today's. They got into a good running back discussion on uh, Inside the Birds. We will uh, talk a little bit more about that on Wednesday. And, uh, of course, uh, Football 4 powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It is uh, each day at 4 o'clock right here. And Jeff Moshe, like all guests, appeared via the boardwalk on the hotline. Moshe, take care, man. All right, fellas. All right, Mike. Have a good one. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, good discussion. I liked it.